Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Cruz, and welcome to the 200th episode of the LeadX Show, where we continue to help you to stand out and to get ahead. And today, of course, we're broadcasting live to our Facebook audience. Podcast listeners, if you want to be notified when we go live on Facebook, just go on to Facebook, search on Lead X Life, and then just like the page, turn on notifications, and then you can join us. And of course, today's the weekly wrap-up show. We get to take our time, rant about whatever we want, answer your questions, and I am joined by Lead X editor, Tara Millett. Tara, 200 episodes. This is wild. I can't believe we're here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. I um, It's 200 episodes and it's not even a year, <laughs> given that it's a daily show, those 200 uh, or five day a week show, those episodes go fast. And um, I had Vanya check on our total download streams. We just broke like 700,000 downloads so far for the last, uh, I guess it's like eight months or so. Wow, that's really impressive. I knew we were doing pretty well, but I didn't hear that number. So that's uh, good to hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I um, It's been crazy because, of course, people who've been listening in, they know the show has evolved and is continuing to evolve. And it's been a journey for me, too. I mean, certainly, well, hopefully I've grown and gotten a little calmer in terms of being a host and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, I mean, when we started, I didn't think that, you know, I'd have a chance to to talk to Alan Alda, talk to Captain Sully Sullenberger, and those are the big names. But then, like, there's just so many people, and this is kind of embarrassing. It's almost mean of me to say, but like, I'll I'll inter agree to interview someone who I hadn't heard of before, and I'm not familiar with their work, so I think it's not going to be a great interview. And then I'll learn like a cool message, and I think the one like one that just popped into my head, um, Jonathan Raymond, CEO of Refound. He's the one that uses the term, be more like Yoda, less like Superman. And I love yeah. that phrase. Like, I mean, a year ago, I'd never heard of that concept. Like, don't try to save your employees. Don't try to solve it for them. Like, let them struggle a little bit. Let them grow, you know, be Yoda-like. And just that whole phrase, less Yoda or less Superman, more Yoda, uh, just was like a great phrase when it comes to management leadership. And so stumbling onto those gems has been a lot of fun as well. No, it's so funny. I don't want to steal any thunder from our iTunes review of the week, but uh, I, I, we kind of discuss a bit about the um, the fact that sometimes an episode comes right when you need it. And I've always found that that happens. You know, if ever you're kind of, I've always have a, a day where I feel like I'm a little bit more of self doubt or I'm feeling a little insecure about something. I would always be working on an episode that had to do with kind of bolstering yourself and feeling better and getting out there and trying your best. And, or you hear a failure story that makes you feel just, oh, okay, so much better <laughs> about where you're heading. Um, so it's been, it's been a pretty wild ride. I, I have, I've really actually enjoyed a lot of the, um, you know, we've had a lot of military guests. Uh, U.S. Army, Navy, uh, fighter pilots. And True. I mean, I always knew there was great leadership, obviously, in that kind of realm. But it was always really fascinating to me because that's a world I, I really don't know much about. So to see these leaders coming out and being like, well, this applies to life and this is how it can help you was always pretty mind blowing to me. So I like that. Yeah, yeah it's been cool. On the military ones, and we and I think you know I'd like to do do more of those in the future. I always wonder about that. I, I never served myself. Have a lot of respect for those uh, who have, and I'll admit I I hesitate a little bit because you know our audience is all over the world and all kinds of different political perspectives, and not everybody thinks that you know leadership in the military or that the military you know is is something that we should be aspiring to or learning lessons from and i think um mm -hmm. most of the comments back so far have been great like we've been learning from entrepreneurs we've been learning from athletes we've been learning from military like i think that's one of our key points is in any time mm -hmm. leadership is influence so anybody who's in a position to have been influencing people or large groups of people, you know, we should look forward to those differences of leadership perspective, even if we don't always relate to the field that they're that they're in. No, exactly. It's so surprising. You know, you, you don't expect to glean so much from an industry that might be so different from yours or an experience that's so different from yours. And yet, 
you know, a lot of the guests have a way of expressing themselves where you're like, okay, well, I see how this might help me in my kind of situation yeah. and what have you. So it's definitely uh, relatable. And I think yeah. I'm, I'm proud of the relatability that's been going on with the show. 200 episodes yeah. strong. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing you commented, which is, has been nice, you know, you talk about how an episode seems to pop up that speaks to something you're going through or thinking about. And we do get a lot of emails like that. And it's, it's almost uncanny. And while, I certainly like the, um, you know, 700,000 downloads, these big, massive numbers. It's great to remember, and we always do that when we get listener email, that this is really about trying to help one person, you know, one person at a time. And a lot of people, we don't share all of these emails because some of them can be, uh, you know, kind of tearjerkers, but people who have gone through or are going through something really bad or, or some kind of crisis. And then they talk about, wow, I listened to the podcast. It was the right message at the right time. And uh, I don't know how the, the world works in, you know, mysterious ways, but it's neat to just, you know, somehow be a, a facilitator of that. It's true. We're, uh, we have an embarrassment of riches in our little base camp where we share you know, short little emails or comments from people with their kind of private situations and how they're kind of overcoming things and the episodes they listen to and what helps them. And it it's really nice to see. You can actually see the effect. I wish we could share all of them, obviously, but uh, right. we try to share as many as we can. <laughs> but it is nice to see it. It's nice to know that, uh, you know, 200 episodes is a lot. But I mean, the next 200, hopefully we'll get even more people. Uh, exactly. Going. Exactly. Yeah. For the next 200, I'm going to continue to talk about the robots taking our jobs. I'm here again with more data, and I know, <laughs> I know, I beat this drum to death, but this is part of my way to motivate everybody to always be a lifelong learner, to have a growth mindset. We always need to be reinventing ourselves. And just in the last week, uh, I stumbled on two studies. Uh, one, and I put like just minutes ago, I put links to these reports into the LeadX page on Facebook. So anybody that is interested in these reports can just find uh, find them on our Facebook uh, page. So one is from the big consulting company, McKinsey, looking at, again, all the changes in technology, what's it going to do to the, the labor force? And, you know, their conservative estimates is that, like, literally in uh, the next 13 years, about 14% of the global workforce will, you know, be out of jobs or have to be retrained. You know, the jobs that they're doing now just aren't going to exist. Um, and, you know, that's hundreds of millions of people. Uh, the United States and Germany, it's actually the highest percent of jobs. And then China has the highest number of jobs that need to get uh, sort of retooled. And the way that McKinsey talks about it is it's almost like, um, you know, we just need this massive Marshall plan of investment in retooling, reskilling, uh, to be competitive as countries, but then also to, to keep our social fabrics from, you know, being torn apart. And, uh, of course, right now, I don't, I don't think any of the countries are really, they don't have a plan for it. They're not really seeing it. And, and right at the same time, another report from an IT, I think it's an IT like research company, Cognizant. They have a report called 21 Occupations of the Future. And I always think these future predictions are kind of funny because, you know, they're, it, nobody can predict the future. So most of these things will be wrong, but you can kind of see the general direction. And that's increasingly as my three kids are now in college, getting ready to go to college. I say, listen, you know, don't sweat so much like what you're going to be when you graduate, because there's going to be job opportunities in 20 years that don't even exist today. So you can't know, you know, what you're going to want to be. But this report, 21 Occupations of the Future, um, one is that they say most organizations will have a chief trust officer to just make sure there's transparency and, you know, good, good trust behind their brand. Another one is going to be an ethical sourcing manager. And that idea is that uh, as consumers, we all care more and more about where our products and food and everything are coming from. And it's easy for a company to make that claim or to even sign contracts with vendors in other countries and stuff who claim to, you know, be ethically sourcing stuff. Uh, but uh, I was just reading somewhere else that um, like a large percentage 
of the um of, of people who say organic, like on things, it's not organic, like a very large percentage. So ethical oh, yeah. sourcing managers, <laughs> yeah, it's like they're going to be enforcing this or making sure that the supply chain is really uh, valid. And then there's ones like data detective, machine learning analyst. And then this is a really far out one, a memory curator, because as virtual reality becomes commonplace, apparently we are going to want to like relive like moments from our childhood Ooh. or different stages of <laughs> life and people that may no longer be around. And so supposedly these memory curators will know how to like, it's kind of like being a biographer or something like they're going to get stuff out of us and then go do research and then recreate these worlds from the past so we can explore them in virtual reality. And that, I don't know, sounds a whole lot of creepy and weird to me, but that's what they're saying. I don't I don't know if you watch Black Mirror on Netflix, but uh I don't. I've, I've seen sounds, a couple episodes. It's uh it's I mean it's harrowing. It's a it's a tough show to watch, but it's a great show to watch. But I mean it it, it kind of reminds me of a few episodes of that where you know people get chips implanted in their head and they can replay their memories so no one ever gets anything wrong and there's ethical dilemmas involved in it. And it's it's super interesting subject matter. I don't know what's going to happen, you know, but I've, I have been pushing my nephew who granted is 22 months old, but I've been telling him, get into robots, get into robots now and engineering robots. If you can build the robots, you'll always have a job. There you go. <laughs> so I, know, I w wish my kids were more into math because that's what I'm saying. It's Ooh. like robots, engineering, you know, that's that's the jobs of the future. So yeah, um, the way to go. Well, I want to say welcome to Matthew from Australia. Really appreciate Matthew you uh, joining us again. This time zone must be working for you somehow. Uh, and of course, Kauru, thank you. 200 episodes. She says congratulations and thanks for being part of this journey. Um, so Tara, I know we're going to answer some questions uh, in a minute, but do you want to start with some fan mail and the iTunes review of the week? Let's. Uh, we've got some nice fan mail today from Marcus, I want to say. And I apologize if I've butchered your name. Feel free to yell at me. That's all on me. Uh, but Marcus says, uh, thoroughly enjoying and appreciate your show, enthusiasm, energy, and wide range of guests. There are days when your topic hits a nerve so perfectly it's karmic. Today's uh, is one such episode with your intro about being on time, not just punctuality, but courtesy, which is lacking in so many areas. It's a relief to learn it's not only me. It's occurred both professionally and personally with assistants, clients, yard people, and even friends. Just wanted to say thank you. I'm a fan and I will figure out how to review on iTunes. That's cool. That's cool. Very nice. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and I'm trying to remember the exact rant or comment that was about the time. I can't remember um, what specifically we said, but I do know I complain about that all the time about uh, <laughs> I'm such a time nut. Of course, I've written about it and all that. So I should be. And and a lot of times I think like, all right, I'm a little too crazy. Like if I was just in a, a more chill culture or still in my roots in Southern California, I wouldn't be so crazy about punctuality, but I, I definitely am. I, I feel like you did a few career tips that had to do with, with punctuality. Oh, that makes sense. I think that might have been it. And then maybe you went on a, a rant after the tip, <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, you know, it's part of the charm. Right, um, right. And uh, <laughs> so, Marcus, thank you so much for doing that. And uh, it's pretty simple to review on iTunes, should you want to. Um, you can just go on iTunes and uh, log in and, and do it from there. Or I think we have some instructions actually on the LeadX website, if I'm not mistaken, on how to get onto the iTunes and leave so. a snazzy review. Uh, speaking of reviews, let's move on to Professor G, which I love. That sounds like Again. a TV show. Yeah, I'm always, you, I always want to change my name. These people are right in, I'm Professor G. Like, I so just, much that's, cooler. Of course, so much cooler. Right? Uh, so Professor G says, um, as a professor of science, it has always astonished me that professors are provided with little to no training on how to become effective teachers and communicators. This is ironic because our job is to teach. The business world has a similar gap in training. Managers and business leaders often lack training in psychology and human performance. This is also ironic because their job is to align human behaviors. This podcast is intriguing because Kevin is providing the tools for listeners to fill the gaps and shortcomings often associated with poor human management. 
Kudos to Kevin. Yay to alliteration. <laughs> I am a big fan of alliteration. <laughs> Me too. It's, uh, it's, it's always pleasant to hear that. But um, Professor G, that was awesome. I love that review. It was so sweet and uh, nice and detailed. So we would love to send you a thank you for doing that. Uh, please write to us at info at leadx.org and we'll send you perhaps a t-shirt or a mug as a little thank you for leaving that. And thanks for everyone who has um, already subscribed and left a rating on iTunes. It is the single biggest favor you can do for us because the more ratings we get, the more likely we are to appear in search results for people who want to find good uh, good podcasts. And everyone, don't forget to head over to leadx.org. Every day is a new free training video you can check out. And while you're there, look at the events tab because we will show you the upcoming live webinars. Um, I'm doing, well, it'll be passed already by the time this one goes out. Um, uh, tomorrow morning, I'll be doing one about how to be a writer for Forbes and other online you know, media outlets like HuffPo and all those kinds of things. So it's less about leadership, a little bit more about just getting your message out and some personal branding. Um, but we have many of our guests coming back to do live webinars so that they can interact with you uh, as well. Yeah, there's some really great ones on the docket. So I encourage everyone to go check it out because I'm definitely going to be tuning in. Uh, so I think we're ready to take on some questions. Uh, for our Facebook Live audience, please feel free to warm up your little fingers and ask some questions now, and we'll see if we can get to them a little later. And Facebook friends, don't forget to click like and share this video, whether you're watching right now live or on the rebroadcast uh, so that others can find us as well. All right, so this first question is from Paul from down in New Zealand. Uh, and I'm actually really intrigued on this. I think this is gonna be a good one. So he says, I am an introvert and dislike confrontation. I've had a career in finance and account management in the IT industry surrounded by extroverts. You have often mentioned that you too are an introvert and dislike confrontation, which when you do, reminds me that I have not really found an effective way to manage this. The feelings are still strong and get in the way of trying to manage situations effectively. Yeah, uh, Paul, thanks for that question. I do talk about, I, I am a massive introvert and separate from being an introvert, I'm just very non-confrontational. You know, I was raised in a family where nobody uh, <laughs> nobody yelled at each other. It was very rare. You know, we didn't argue at the dinner table over things passionately. So it was very quiet, orderly family. So, you know, it's like I get startled by argument very easily. And <clears throat> Paul, you know, I think that one thing I've learned, again, as part of my journey on these shows is that as I ask about how should managers give feedback, how do we handle uh, crucial conversations, confrontational conversations, Almost everybody says it's not natural for anybody. Like nobody likes to do it. You know, we're all raised by saying, you know, we should just get along. And if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And so for all of us, we sort of have to grow into this professional courage as adults to be effective. And so I think that never goes away. I think what's made it easier for me is, and, um, uh, I mentioned, I'm trying to think, um, Paul and everybody, we just started our Monday management tips and tools and rules. And the first series is on effective feedback. And, you know, one of the things we talk about is the Gallup research that shows that people are more engaged at work, more motivated, more connected when they get more feedback from their boss, from their supervisor, including negative feedback. So most people want to get more feedback because um, they want to keep, they want to advance in their career. They want to get better and they view the boss as a coach. It's a little trickier if it's peer to peer. Uh, but again, if you're doing it from a place of, of caring and you're providing feedback, you know, not to punish someone, not to be mean to somebody, but to make them better, to make a project better, usually it's received the right way. And so, you know, once I understood that research that people actually want to get more feedback, people are willing to have a difference of opinion as long as you're arguing about the opinion and not the person, I've gotten a little bit uh, a little bit better about it. How about you, Tara? Do you, yeah, uh, you you're usually one to say <laughs> I just charge at things head on, right? I tend to like to get things out there. Uh, contrary to your upbringing, I have a very big, loud, uh, argumentative family in a great way. Um, I but you that know, wasn't, that didn't happen in Canada, though, right? 
Everybody's so polite. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're from French Canada, so oh, it's a little different. Funny. We're a little, oh yeah, we're a little rough around the edges, okay? But uh, no, it, you know, I, I, I do like to get things out there. That's my, that's my way of doing things. But for better or worse, that's also gotten me into trouble. You know, when I try to say, hey, is there an issue here? Should we talk about this? And people are like, oh, I don't, you know, and then I make people more uncomfortable. So, um, so you know, being an introvert and being an extrovert in that kind of situation, there's no real advantage. Like Kevin said, no one likes doing it. Uh, and and I, think, uh, I think you brought up a good point. Um, it's never received personally. And if it is, then, um, then try to work on your delivery because for whatever reason, maybe it's coming across a different way. But I think for the most part, if you're just telling someone, hey, in the future, I'd prefer if you did this instead of this, you know, that's not unusual for a boss to say to a direct report. And that's usually never going to be taken in the wrong way. And so I think the risk that you're kind of imagining of someone kind of flying off the handle or getting really upset or crying. I think that risk is really, really low. I think there are very few situations where someone would really just have an outburst over, over some, some criticism at work. Um, so keep that in mind that the risk is low. And also this is kind of a, a, a side topic, but I'm not sure I really believe in introvert and extrovert. No, I think that's kind of a binary, binary way of thinking very about people. Binary, um, binary. You know, I, I'm extroverted. I have no problem talking to people. I don't mind being on stage. I don't, you know, that doesn't scare me. Um, but there are times when, gosh, I just want to be alone, hold up in my room, reading a book or, you know, just being on my own. And I'd rather not socialize. I think people have different parts. And I would argue that, Paul, you know, with your friends and, and, and family, I'm sure you're perfectly extroverted and able to kind of uh, speak your opinions and have a kind of gentle debate. So it's OK to bring that side of yourself, that side of yourself that has a little more trust with the people around you at work, um, that there isn't going to be this big reaction. Um, so I think uh, I think that's probably a good way of thinking about it, too. You're, you're not in any one category. Right. There's different yeah. facets. Yeah. And Tara, I like that because I've been. Um for some of the other work we're doing with LeadX, I've been looking at different uh, personality assessment tools and all that kind of stuff. And I think you know, part of why things like MBTI and DISC, the, the big personality things have been successful is because they've simplified them. And uh, I was actually yeah. thinking about this with our article uh, with, with Ron Warren, where there's all, you know, there's degrees of personality, facets of personality. And most mm -hmm. people will just say, I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert, very binary. And there's no, you, no matter what the personality scale is, you're a grady, you're, you're on that, not to mention different in different situations. So I'm, I think that's a really good point. And um, to, to not just label ourselves or assume we're, we're one way. And then at risk of uh, going on too long on this, Tara, I also just remembered that I was talking to Kim Scott. She's the author of Radical Candor. This was just a couple of weeks ago. And Kim Scott uh, created and taught the very first Managing at Apple course. So pretty cool uh, experience. And I was asking her, like, what should a new manager do in her first 90 days? And Kim is all about giving effective feedback. So her answer had to do with that. But like, I think it was the first 30 days, she said, just give positive feedback. Don't try to give constructive or, you know, negative, uh, negative feedback. And I think in wow. uh, Paul's um, question, if I was trying to develop myself in this area to, you know, have these kind of confrontation conversations, I would probably start by spending 30 days just looking for opportunities to share my agreement and to voice my where I agree with people and where I support them. And right. because then, I mean, I think you sort of practice just getting out there and mixing it up, but in a safer area agreement. And you might build up that kind of like emotional goodwill, that bank account, so that you then, if some, you know, one day you show up and say, hey, I actually don't agree with that idea and here's why, or I think you made a mistake and here's how you should have done it better. It might, it might be received better uh, as well. So that's the only other thought I just had coming from Kim Scott. No, that's a great idea too. Cause I feel like just trying to put myself in the shoes of an employee with a new boss. And then the first thing out of their mouth to me is 
you know, maybe criticism, it, it might, you know, it might affect the way people see you a little bit. Um, so I think there's definitely some truth to that. That's a nice idea just to kind of let them know that you're seeing the good work first. Right. right. And then just trying to improve from there. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great point. Are we ready for question number two? Sure. This is from Sarah and she says, uh, I'm an HR professional and I'm also currently doing a master's program on managerial psychology at the University of Lagos, Nigeria. I'm looking into researching employee engagement, which is a new area in human resource organizational development. But most companies are starting to realize it's true importance. I specifically need measurement instruments for employee engagement. The availability of this will greatly influence my choice of a research topic. You're the perfect person to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sarah, thanks for that question. Oddly, you know, this is a pretty uh, wonkish question, but I get it a fair amount. So for those for those listeners who aren't as familiar, you know, I've done a lot of work in this area of employee engagement, which is just the emotional connection we have to our organization and its goals. You know, how how connected do we feel? And the question always comes up, you know, how do you measure how we feel about work. So it's we measure it through employee surveys and it's not perfect. I mean, we can't measure feelings perfectly, but there will be questions like, you know, uh, in the last six months, I haven't thought about looking for another job. You know, if you're really miserable, you have been looking for another job. If you love the place you work, you would not have been looking for another job in the last six months. So there's questions like that. And so Sarah, the answer is a couple of things. First of all, I offer a very short 10-question uh, employee engagement survey in my book, Employee Engagement 2.0, but you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. It's somewhere on kevincruz.com. You can just get the questions, and I let anybody use those questions. So we don't have a data bank. It's not a validated instrument, but I do let people use those all the time, you know, free of charge. And that's the same instrument I use in the rare occasions when we're doing consulting uh, work. The authoritative instrument, well, I should say most popular, most well-known is called the Gallup Q12. So they have a 12 question instrument that they've really built their company and their brand on. And again, if you just Google Gallup Q12, you'll find those questions. And many of our listeners, maybe, you know, you want to do that just to understand how we measure, how we look at engagement of employees. But that is a copyrighted instrument. You can't use it without their prior permission. And I don't know if for research purposes, they would let you do that. And then there's all kinds of other instruments out there, some good, some not so good. But um, use Mind Free or check out Q12 and maybe ask for permission would be my uh, suggestion. That's great. And what an interesting topic. I'm, I'm curious to see if she reaches out again and, and tells us whether or not she's going forth with that. <laughs> I would love to know the, the research. Yeah, like the results from any research that anybody's doing in that. It's um, a lot of the big companies are doing research, but they tend to hold it on as proprietary and there's not a lot of academic research out there. I wonder if Pew Research would be useful for that. But I know sometimes their topics tend to be a bit different, but sometimes they touch on workplace happiness and yeah, stuff. We, so that might be... Yeah, uh, Sarah should check that out and we will check that out too so we would know. That's yeah. a great organization. We actually do have a question um, from Down Under, Matthew Walker, and it's, uh, um, it's a question, I think he's also making a, a point in a nice way. He says, how important is building trust so you can be comfortable with each other to provide effective feedback? When we were answering Paul's question, you know, about that. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Matthew, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I think that that's right. This whole idea of like psychological safety, you know, in the workplace. And I'm hearing more and more people say that that's really a top job of a leader is to create an environment of psychological safety where you can uh, experiment and fail and it's okay. And we want that because that drives innovation. You can make a mistake or cause a problem and quickly tell your boss about it and, and feel safe doing that. And we want that because it's easier to, to tackle a problem when it's small than when it's been brushed under the rug and, and hidden. And I think it's the same thing with this giving feedback. If you've built that connection of trust and, and, you know, used authenticity and revealed, you know, my own shortcomings, all the millions of ways I continue to fail and don't know about stuff, then um, hopefully there's a trusting relationship and that 
it makes it easier for us to give, you know, constructive uh, criticism, feedback, differing ideas to each other. I think that's really important. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point. I wonder if Paul could benefit from maybe sharing a bit more about when, you know, when he has moments where he messes up or something and just sharing that with employees right. once in a while so they know that he's human. And then, you know, when he Get gives vulnerable. criticism, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, build that trust. I like that. That's a good idea. All right. So uh, I think what we have coming up next week, if people are okay with a bit of a yeah. teaser, um, we've got some really interesting stuff, actually. Well, we have Manager Monday, which is uh, pretty new. And if anyone out there hasn't uh, experienced it yet, it's where Kevin digs into very practical and specific tools uh, for leaders and managers. Uh, and then we have Tina Selig the author of Creativity Rules, Get Ideas Out of Your Head and Into the World. And she's gonna give us her best tips for unleashing your creativity. Uh, Nate Regier, I didn't listen to the audio yet, so I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. <laughs> You'll probably um, listen to the audio and hear me mispronounce it, so that's fine. <laughs> okay, all right, so we're in the same boat. I like yeah. that. Uh, and he's a former practicing psychologist and the author of Conflict Without Casualties, a field guide for leading with compassionate accountability, Paul, this might be for you. And he's going to discuss how to handle conflict at work. Perfect. Just could not be better people, lined up I was there say, with People karma. think we set this up, but we don't set it up. We don't. We don't. It just happens. Uh, and then we have our Throwback Thursday episode with Chris Voss, which is, um, I think, one of my favorites, I have to say. It really surprised me how much I really liked it. He's a former FBI agent, and he discusses the kind of the keys to negotiating really well. And he's the author of the book, Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as if your life depended on it. It's very harrowing too. He tells some really crazy stories. Yeah, I I, um, I thought of Chris Voss when we were talking about 200 episodes. And again, I mean, I um, he, his, he had a big book out. It was promoted very well, but I didn't know anything about him ahead of time. And just uh, probably the best negotiating book I've ever read, not probably, was the best negotiating book I've ever read. And then to talk to him, he was one of those guys who like, I'm in awe. Here's this, you know, FBI, former FBI agent who has literally negotiated like behind the door of a hostage taker and bank robbers and terrorists. Like, this is crazy to me. And I'm in awe of this guy. And it's ta like talking to a buddy at the bar, you know, putting back a beer. So yeah. like, such a down to earth, regular, nice guy. Uh, we had a couple of exchanges, you know, via via email afterwards, which is really nice. And we'll have to get them, you know, back on the show because that that's a that it's a really really good episode for anyone who hasn't hasn't heard that one. Absolutely, it's so true. You, you expect it to be this kind of stiff, you know, uh, by the book kind of, and he's just a really nice laid back guy. But yeah, it's going to be really fun. So that's next week. So friends, before we wrap up, don't forget, go to leadx.org forward slash subscribe and just click some stars and like write one sentence. It won't take you very long. It means the world to us. And Tara, can you believe we are going to be out here on episode 200? I mean, I'm, I'm excited for our episode 300 now. <laughs> it's going to be here before we know it. Like, again, I can't believe 200 have gone by this fast. So 300 will be here like, oh, my gosh, that was just yesterday. But anyway, until yeah. then, I've said it 200 times now. Remember, leadership is not a choice because leadership is influence. We are influencing. We are leading all of the time. So today, please consider, how are you going to lead today? <laughs>